Standing on Trial for Your Beliefs, The Biblical Calendar In John chapter 8, verse 32, Christ tells us, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is a presentation from 144,000teachers.org. Do you know what you believe? Taken from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 707. Many who profess to have a knowledge of present truth know not what they believe. They do not understand the evidences of their faith. They have no just appreciation of the work for the present time. When the time of trial shall come, they are men now preaching to others who will find upon examining the position they hold that there are many things for which they can give no satisfactory reason. Until thus tested, they knew not their great ignorance. And there are many in the church who take it for granted that they understand what they believe, but until controversy arises, they do not know their own weakness. When separated from those of like faith and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, they will be surprised to see how confused are their ideas of what they had accepted as truth. Question. How to answer for your faith in the court of law? And the answer is by using this method which is based on two important principles. The first principle is cross-referencing, and the second one is enunciation and illustration. In Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9, 10, and 13, we read, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? The word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, Line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And this is actually one of the best explanation of cross-referencing by finding the precept or the principle or the universal law that are contained in the Word of God and finding out all the verses that are going along with this to explain that universal law. The second principle tells you what to do once you have found the universal law or the precept or the principle that is being taught in the Word of God. And this is through enunciation and illustration. According to the book of Living Fountains or Broken Cisterns, page 59, we read, God teaches by the enunciation of principles or universal laws such as we saw in Isaiah 28. And the Holy Spirit, which comes by faith, enlightens the senses that they may grasp the illustration of these laws in the physical world. That is Evan's method of teaching the angelic throng, and it was the method applied before the fall. The Biblical Calendar on Trial he who rules over the calendar rules over the nations. What is the primary purpose of calendation? Although calendars have been used throughout history for economic, agricultural, social, or political reasons, the main purpose for creating calendars was and is still today for religious reasons, to worship God or gods at appointed times. The calendar you use represents the God or gods you serve, whether you like it or not. This is why there are so many calendars throughout history and in the world today. This is why there are many so-called biblical calendars among those who believe in the Torah and the Bible. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, For God who commanded the light, to shine out of darkness as shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Using this allegory in the physical world on how to identify a genuine diamond, 
we will be demonstrating and illustrating actually how this universal law is applicable for us today more than ever. The only way to identify a genuine diamond is by knowing its properties, reflection, refraction, and dispersion. Actually, in the book of Job, chapter 38, verse 24, God actually tells us this way that the light is parted, which is exactly what is reflection, refraction, and dispersion. Reflection is the light that hits the diamond at the top and is immediately bounced back up, giving it an instantaneous shine. While this glimmer is impressive, it is only the very tip of the true radiance a diamond displays. Only a portion of the light is reflected. The rest travels through it and is scattered and fractured, creating the sparkle that diamonds are known for. And this is refraction. Then the light is being aimed back towards the top and out through the surface. This creates a rainbow effect and adds to the shine. This is dispersion. In the spiritual world, this is how biblical truth shines ten times brighter. The Holy Spirit reflects the light of the Bible in a consecrated human channel or pure mind. Then he refracts the truth and gives knowledge and understanding. And finally, he disperses it to the world through that prepared human channel. Adopting now the principle of how to identify a genuine diamond to the most highly principle of the biblical calendar, we will be looking at the only way to identify the true biblical calendar by knowing its properties, which are luni solar cycle based, barley harvest based, a new moon on crescent, a year that can be either common or embolismic, depending if it needs an intercalation, and a day that runs from sunset to sunset. Using the principle that we have seen as well of cross-referencing and enunciation and illustration, we will see the biblical calendar shining ten times brighter. These properties will be illustrated in the order that they are found in the Bible. And again, applying this principle to the biblical calendar, we know now that the Holy Spirit is the one that makes all truth of the Bible shine ten times brighter because he reflects the light of the biblical calendar, in this case, in a consecrated human channel. He refracts it, giving knowledge and understanding of it, and then he disperses it to the world by that channel. As we enunciate now the universal laws and illustrate them with the physical laws, we will start with the first universal law having to do with the biblical calendar in the Bible, and it's Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God created is the first divine action. Beginning is related to time, and it is illustrated in the physical world through the applied science of astronomy. Heaven relates to space, and it's illustrated in the physical world through the applied science of astrophysics. Earth is related to matter and is illustrated in the physical world with the applied science of chemistry and adding to this mathematics as this science is used practically in all the applied sciences. If you want to know more about this wonderful principle, how to enunciate the universal law and illustrate them by the physical laws, please make sure to visit our website and also our YouTube video where this is explained very well. The second universal law that we will be using here is God created the group of seven days or hebdomad, which is a Greek word which means actually group of seven days. And it's found in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. God himself called the seven-day Sabbath, 
for the first time in Exodus chapter 16 and chapter 20. And the evening and the morning were the first day. This is being repeated six times in the word of the Lord in Genesis chapter 1, and in that order, evening and morning. We find this repetition in Genesis chapter 1, verses 5, 8, 13, 19, 23, and 31. So remember, if God repeats himself, we better listen. Evening, as is expressed in the book of Genesis chapter 1, represent the night, the darkness, and it's composed of 12 hours. Morning is defined as the day, the light, and it's another 12 hours. And the day is set within the sunset to the sunset, and according to the Levitical laws of cleanliness, we can confirm an evening to an evening as the length of the day. Continuing now with Universal Law number 3, taken from Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, we read, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. What we are concentrating on right now is on the signs, the seasons, the days, and the years. And of course, for further study, because we do not have time to cover all the material here, we have done a study already on the Maserat, which we give you the link for your perusal. You may appreciate studying more about this wonderful subject. Now, the signs here are the stars or the constellations. The Maserat is made up of 12 constellations. That word is found in Job chapter 38, verses 31 and 32, and is basically repeated in a way in the book of Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, regarding the woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. The revelation here shows us a woman which in chapter 12 is a pure woman. She's under a constant attack from Lucifer, the dragon, the old serpent, Satan. And this woman is clothed with the sun, pointing to the moon and the stars as well. And this woman being a pure woman, in the prophetic word, she would be the church, the pure church. And just before she faces the cataclysm or the apocalyptic events of Revelation 13, we could say, she's clothed with the sun, the moon, and the 12 stars, which makes it that she is knowledgeable of the biblical calendar, a luni solar, barley harvest calendar, which includes the Maseroth of Job chapter 38. Very, very important to recognize this. And the word seasons, we point to the moon, meaning the month in Hebrew, and the word feast, which stands for seasons, according to Hebrew number 4150 in the Concordance. And we read from Psalm chapter 104, verse 19, that God appointed the moon for seasons. So therefore, God appointed his own time of worship, which brings together the stars, the sun, the moon, the seasons, which has to do with the feast. In this explanation of the word seasons in the Hebrew language, we also discover that it means appointed time, solemn assembly, holy convocations. So it's not related necessarily to spring, fall, winter, and summer, because this was written before there was the flood, before there was seasons. It has to convey a very, very high meaning, and that high meaning is actually worship time, the time we are to meet to worship our Creator. And finally, the days and the years. We know that the sun is to rule the day and the year, and the day is set within a sunset to sunset, and the moon and the stars rule the night. Again, we continue with Universal Law number 4, with the common and the embolismic year, which is very much part of the biblical calendar. A solar cycle, according to astronomy, 
is 365 days per year. The lunar cycle is 354 days per year. And the difference between the two is 11 days. That difference of 11 days accumulates over time and an additional month is added, called embolismic year, every two to three years to make up the difference. And this is also called an intercalation. 31 AD and 1844 were embolismic years among others. And a regular year without intercalation is called a common year. Another important universal law explaining the prophetic year in the Bible is based on 360 days, which can be obtained by adding the two cycles and dividing by two, the cycle of the sun, which precisely is 365.24 days, and 354.37 days is the lunar cycle. And when you add the two, you obtain 719.61 days. And you round it up, will make it 720. You divide by two, and this is where the 360 comes from. It does not come from Genesis chapter 7 with the 150 days. Any of you would like a view of the, uh, the Chronicle of the Flood? We also have this on our website. And that can be seen very clearly that that 155 50 days cannot be divided in order to obtain a 30 day a month. This does not work that way. The fifth enunciated universal law in the Bible identifying the properties of the biblical calendar is found in Genesis chapter 7 verse 11. And it is a major, major universal law. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. This verse of chapter 7, verse 11 of Genesis, is the first verse and the first biblical synchronism mentioning the year, month, and day pattern in the Bible. There are over 100 synchronisms or dated events that are found in the Bible, which can be ascertained with genealogy and chronology and can only be reckoned with the true biblical calendar. The book of Genesis, chapters 7 and 8, contains 13 synchronism ascertained by genealogy. The book of Ezekiel contains 14 synchronism ascertained by chronology. For further study on genealogy, synchronism, and chronology, specifically on 457 BC and October 22nd, 1844 accuracy, we encourage you to peruse the link attached here on breaking the code, chronology, and synchronism. The sixth universal law is found in Psalm 19, verse 4, and Job chapter 38, verse 5. Their line is gone out through all the earth. He set a tabernacle for the sun, who had stretched the line upon it. The ecliptic line, as it's called in astronomy, is the path the sun takes through the sky as a result of the Earth's revolution around it and represents the extension or projection of the plane of the Earth's orbit out towards the sky. Since the moon and the planets always moved in orbits whose planes do not differ greatly from that of the Earth's orbit, these bodies, when visible in our sky, stay relatively close to the line. Twelve cardinal constellations in their seasons through which the ecliptic line passes form the Mazaroth of Job, chapter 38, verse 32, as we saw, or Zodiac, and the sun travels the ecliptic line from one constellation to another in one year, and the moon north and south of it in one month. The sky is divided astronomically in 88 constellations, 12 cardinals, and 76 deacons.
And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feast. We encourage you to read from Leviticus chapter 23, verses 1 to 44, to get better acquainted with the feast of the Lord. The seven universal law pointing to the property of the biblical calendar is the Sabbath and the spring feast. The seventh day Sabbath is mentioned in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2, and the spring feast as a continuation are the Passover, the unleavened bread, the first fruits, and Pentecost, with the fall feast of trumpets, day of atonement, and tabernacles. The eighth universal law brings in the new moon, the new year, and the spring feast. And the question often asked is how to ascertain the new moon, the new year, the first month of the religious calendar. And the answer is we need two witnesses, the moon and a grain. The second question, which moon and which grain? The answer is the Passover moon and the wave sheaf grain for first fruits. We are showing here for the month of April 2019 and October 2019 the spring and the fall feast. For saving of time here we are giving you the YouTube link where we have prepared a video explaining in much more depth than we could do here the biblical calendar for 2018-2019 including the feast of the Lord which we encourage you to visit and to listen to and to learn how we come up with these beautiful calendars and beautiful dates inclusive of the seventh Sabbath, the spring and the fall feast. Continuing with the ninth universal law in order to identify the properties of the biblical calendar. Wave sheaf at first fruits, barley. Exodus chapter 9 verses 31 and 32 give us this detail on the seventh plague and the grain. And the flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was in the year and the flax was bold. But the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. So what's the importance of which grain we are looking at here. Leviticus chapter 23 verses 10 and 11 gives an explanation. And ye shall reap the harvest thereof. Then ye shall bring a sheave of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And ye shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. The barley which was smitten under the seventh plague preceded the tenth plague at Passover on the fourteenth day of the first month, according to Exodus chapter 12, verse 6. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 539, confirms how important that grain was. Barley was the earliest grain in Palestine, and at the opening of the feast it was beginning to ripen. A sheaf of this grain was waved by the priest before the altar of God. The altar of God in this is the altar of incense. And it was at first fruits on the first month, the month of Abib, on the 16th, which is the day after the Sabbath of Unleavened Bread. Please remember to visit our video explaining further of the spring and the fall feast for 2019. Continuing with the 10th universal law, the wave sheaf at first fruits, barley, we have one more detail to present to you. If the barley was not ripened for the spring feast, another month was added at the end of the year, and the feast was celebrated one month later that year. The embolismic year was connected with barley. The 11th Universal Law brings in the new moon on crescent. Question. 
why the new moon of the first month has to be the new moon on the crescent. Answer. In order for Passover to be on the 14th of the first month, or Abid 14, according to Exodus chapter 12, verse 6, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5, Numbers chapter 28, verse 16, the new moon must be the horned crescent, not the conjunction, nor the first visible crescent. The reason is a conjunction new moon would advance Passover by two days. A first visible crescent would advance Passover by one day and will make it occur on the full moon as it happens with the rabbinical Jew Passover. History confirms that the Passover day was the day following the full moon at sunset and not on it. If you look at the calendar for April 2019 and look at the full moon which occurs on the 19th of April 2019 Gregorian Reckoning or the 13th of the first biblical month, you will see that on the 20th of April 2019, Gregorian Reckoning will be the 14th of the first month, or the 14th of Abib, which is Passover, followed on the 21st of April 2019, Gregorian Reckoning, by the 11 bread, which correspond to the 15th of the first biblical month, and this is our at 144,000teachers.org, we always calculate the Passover. Continuing with the 12 universal law, new moon, on crescent, and Passover, we read in Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And in history, taken from Grace Abaddon Collection, Part 5, Crucifixion Date, pages 29, 4, and 38, we read, If we accept the testimony of Aristobulus, 200 years before Christ, that the Passover of the Jews follow the sunset of the day, when the full moon rising in the east faces the setting sun in the west, we can reasonably conclude that the Jewish Passover, which is repeatedly described in the Bible as the 14th day of Nisan or Abib or first month, was the day following the full moon date and not on it, or was the day after the evening when the moon stands diametrically opposed to the sun as everyone can see at the time of full moon. Confirming this, in Desire of Ages, page 685, we read, In company with his disciples, the Savior slowly made his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. The Passover moon, broad and full, shone from a cloudless sky. The city of pilgrims' tents was ushed into silence. The expression, moon, broad and full, as we read here from the Zara of Ages, is an old expression which define and describe exactly what we just read from Aristobulus. It's the day when the moon and the sun are looking at each other, the same evening at sunset. And as it's confirming here, if the disciple and the Savior were in the Garden of Gethsemane when the moon was full and broad, it had to be the Abib 13 and not Abib 14, which would be right after this monthly event of the full moon when the sun and the moon are looking at each other and then followed by complete sunset and then the next day start, which would be the 14 of Abib, which would be Passover. And in that same afternoon, the next day, Christ is crucified, which corresponds again in April 2019 to the 20th of April 2019 Gregorian Reckoning, and it is the 14th of the first biblical month, Passover. As we look now at the 13th Universal Law, the Sanctuary and the Biblical Calendar, in order to continue to identify the properties of the Biblical Calendar, we are invited through Psalm 77, verse 13, to find our way. 
Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? The sanctuary is a beautiful study, and because of shortness of time here, we invite you to visit www.numbers1317.org with the link that we show you here in order to find much more regarding the sanctuary. This universal law right now of the sanctuary and the biblical calendar will strictly be regarding where do we find the feast in the sanctuary and these feasts without the biblical calendar would make the sanctuary of no value. This is a fact. The sanctuary has an anatomy, which is the way it is made, its structure. But the sanctuary without a physiology, which is the great high priest, and also its functioning is what brings it alive. And that's why in the court you will find the first feast, the Passover, Abib 14, or the 14 of the first month, because that's where the lamb was offered. That's where you find the altar of burnt offering and the laver. In the holy place on the side of the north, you find the table of showbread. And this is where the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 15th of Abib, or the first month, would be represented. Now we go to the altar of incense, where the sheaf was waved before the Lord on the 16th of Abib, or the 16th of the first month, at first fruits. On the south side of the holy place, in the tabernacle, was the candlestick pointing to the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, which was always celebrated seven weeks complete on the first day following the Sabbath, and this is where Pentecost is represented in the holy place. As we are about ready to enter into the Most Holy, we know the Feast of Trumpets on the first of the seventh month was announcing the Great Day of Atonement, which was the only day during the year where the Most Holy Place was to be opened and only the Great High Priest was allowed to enter it. And of course, after the wonderful Day of Atonement, where it's a day of judgment, where it's a good judgment for those who have their name inscribed in the Book of Life and their records is removed, then comes the last feast of the hall, the feast, the spring and the fall feast, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, which points to the second coming. So you can see again how important is the knowledge of the biblical calendar in order to keep those feasts accordingly. Don't you remember that in Isaiah chapter 66, it's very clear. We need to know the moon and we need to know those Sabbaths, including the 70 Sabbaths. The 14 universal law demonstrate Christ's fulfillment in the New Testament of the calendar of Leviticus chapter 23 and also Numbers 28 and 29. We can actually show you 11 facts regarding the biblical calendar and how Christ fulfilled and is still fulfilling the beautiful calendar to this day. Fact number one, Christ was selected to die the 10th day of the first month in 31 AD. Fact number two, Christ died on the 14th day. Fact number three, Christ died at the hours of evening sacrifice. Fact number four, Christ died at the ninth hour, which is between 3 and 6 p.m. Fact number five, Christ died, died at the Feast of Passover. Fact number six, Christ rested on the Feast of Unleavened Bread and a seven-day Sabbath. Fact number seven, Christ resurrected at first fruits. Fact number eight, Christ sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Fact number nine, Christ announced the judgment to the Millerites at trumpets. Fact number 10, Christ entered the most holy place on the Day of Atonement on October 22, 1844. Fact number 11, Christ is returning at tabernacles. And again, to understand further 
all of these wonderful truths which might be very new to you, we invite you to visit the link attached. From Isaiah chapter 66 verse 23 we read, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, said the Lord. Universal law number 15 is simply to invite you to recognize that when people tell you that you need to show the biblical calendar with the Bible and the Bible alone, this is what we have done. But you must admit that astronomy is a science, the same as archaeology, chronology, history, and the spirit of prophecy, and these physical laws or applied sciences and other sciences, same as the science of redemption, they are all part of the Bible because we know now that the Creator renunciated the universal laws and illustrated them through His physical world. So an efficient method then to study and to teach the biblical calendar, if you choose to, is by using Bach, B-A-A-C-H-S, and this is what those beautiful science and else represents here. We have a testing time now as to which properties belong to the biblical calendar. And these are not only different properties, some of them are wrong, absolutely wrong. And they actually represent most of the calendar you will find. The calendars today are very much into a disarray. The biblical calendar now is interpreted every different ways. And it's not surprising because when the truth comes, this is how the enemy mingles in the tears and confuse the issue. So as a test, after you have listened to this presentation, we encourage you to check for yourself out of these 11 properties, which one are right and which one are wrong. Some are definitely wrong, but some are definitely right. And if you care to let us know, you can contact us actually with the email that we have attached here as a link. Remember, the biblical calendar shines 10 times brighter because the Holy Spirit is the one that reflects the light of his calendar in a consecrated human channel or pure mind. He refracts the truth and gives knowledge and understanding. Then he disperses it to the world through that prepared human channel. Daniel chapter 7 verse 25. We have a very important warning. And he shall think to change the time and the law. Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 136. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. The nation will be on the side of the great rebel leader. The references for further studies of the biblical calendar can be found on www.numbers1317.org and we give you here a list of the subject that must be covered in order to fully understand and better understand the biblical calendar.